Hey everyone, Jason from Altone Audio again. And what we have today is a whole bunch of hardware. We have some XLR connectors, both male and female, from Neutrik and Switchcraft. We have PowerCon connector, we have SpeakCon connector, and the ever popular combo jack. And most importantly, we have a rack panel. And what I'm gonna talk about today is how all this stuff goes together, or more importantly, how sometimes it doesn't all go together. Now, if you've ever kicked around the idea of having a custom panel made for your home studio, or your PA system, or a mobile recording rig, I would highly recommend that you look into it. It's really a great way to make sure that you're utilizing all the inputs and outputs on your system and you're bringing them all together in a consolidated location using the connectors that you want. It can really be liberating to just be, have all of your I.O. easily accessible with nice professional connectors on them. Uh, and especially for mobile systems, it can really kind of speed up your setup and your teardown times, and it just really kind of helps all your gear and your racks just really look professional, gives it like a really nice look, and also the it just adds a lot of function to them as well. Now, when you're getting into this kind of stuff, th there are tons of vendors out there that can build whatever you want. However, the reason we're doing this is I was going to suggest that you may really want to consider doing this as a DIY project. Assuming you already know what to do on the back of the panel and you're good with soldering and you already have your cable selections and you're not going to have any problems with the termination, then just getting all of your jacks uh, mounted up in the panel is actually a pretty straightforward process. Now, there are some pitfalls you can run into and that's what I want to talk about today and hopefully we can avoid those. Now, one other thing, if you are considering doing this as a DIY project, you may have considered maybe just going out and getting a blank panel and actually drilling it yourself. Uh, I typically don't recommend that people do this. While you certainly can do it at home, there are plenty of other videos out there where people get out the, the stepper bits or, or whatever and they drill everything and do the layout. It really is a lot of work and I think for the price for what vendors charge you for these pre-cut panels, um, it's it's a lot of work and a lot of attention to detail to get, to get something that has the same form fit and function as something that's already done for you. So again, if you want to do it, knock yourself out, but if you're just doing like a small project or a one-off, I would say just go ahead and buy the pre-punch panel. It's just gonna save you a lot of time and frustration. And of course I said that, but I'm working on doing it myself. Okay, I want to start getting into hardware and I'm gonna talk about a lot of different hardware options. But if you really just want to keep this simple, uh, you will have no problem just heading on down to the local hardware store, getting a couple bags of good old-fashioned uh, flathead Phillips 440, three-eighths or half-inch long and call it a day. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with that. However, if you want to get a few more options, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff uh, that you're probably not going to be able to find at your local hardware store. Uh, even though I have a couple of Fastenal stores near me and even a couple of machine shop supply stores, um, there are some stuff that I just couldn't find readily it, it, between them and the big boxes, like trying to find uh, anything smaller than an M4 or any of the black oxide stuff. It's just a little bit difficult for me to find locally, and I certainly couldn't find one shop where I could get everything. So I tended to go online for a lot of my hardware purchases. I get everything from uh, McMaster Car and or Bolt Depot. It just depends on the prices and the shipping and all that kind of stuff. Don't want to overthink this, even though I'm going to give you a lot of information. If you just want to pick up a few bags of these, it's just going to be fine. Um, if you want to try something else, uh, I'm going to put a lot of part numbers down in the description so it'll make it easy to find everything I'm going to be talking about. The very first place I recommend when you start uh, specking out parts for your panel project is start looking at some technical diagrams on the connectors that you may want to use. Uh, we're going to look at some Neutrik ones to start, and these PDFs, you can download these right from the product pages on the Neutrik website and on the Switchcraft website too, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And the first question you want to ask is, how big are these D-holes that all these panel manufacturers say they cut their panels to? So. Uh, now again, this is not the measurements for the connector itself. These are the measurements they expect to see in the panel that you're going to mount the connector into. So the one number you always see that's pretty consistent is the center barrel uh, hole, which is 24 millimeters across or 0.945 inches. Um, point, or 3.4 millimeters or 0.134 inches for the hardware holes. And they don't actually tell you how big the hole is in the actual connector uh, on this particular diagram. And this is one of the inconsistencies you'll see. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, it's not a huge deal, but it is in case you want to just kind of stretch your hardware limits a little bit. Like I said, they, uh, they recommend three millimeters. You could easily get away with 440 on this, maybe step up to the 540, because that's enough room for that. Um, but if you wanted to get up to the 632 hardware, um, well, one, that's going to be a little bit too small for that hole. And two, you don't even know if that's going to be able to fit through the connector. This is something where you may have to dig a little bit deeper, look through some of the diagrams, or actually just buy one or get your hands on one and just physically try to put the bolt through and see if it's going to fit. 
So same thing, we're gonna look at a slightly different part number. This is nitric again, NC3FD-LX. And you'll see some consistency here. Again, we're seeing 24 millimeters, 0.945 inches for our center hole, but there is a difference in the hardware mounting holes where for whatever reason they're down to 3.1 millimeters or 0.122 inches. Again, not a huge deal. This is just the panel specification. It's just what they recommend. If you wanted to buy this NC3FD-LX and your panel was actually cut because that manufacturer happened to get a hold of an NC3FD-H, blah, 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 whatever. As long as it fits, it's gonna fit. Now, this one, it is telling you in this rear view here how big the hole is on the actual connector and it's saying 3.5 millimeters or 0.138 inches, which is good news because then that's confirming for us we can use the M3, we can use the 440, we can use the 540, although that's the exact same size as the 632, so I'd say that's probably stretching it just a little bit. You're not gonna be able to use that bigger size of hardware on here if that was something you were planning on doing. Now, one other number we're gonna take a look at, and that's the space between the hardware mounting holes. And on this one, it's 19 millimeters or 0.748 inches. And the next diagram we're gonna look at shows you how you can really get into trouble when you're shopping for panels. If I pull up yet another Neutric part, this is the NC3FP-1, you can see that this is quite a bit different. Same 24 millimeter hole in the center, 3.1 for the hardware mounting holes, but look how much closer together they are. 16.7 millimeters, 0.657 inches. Now I actually have this part and I'm gonna throw it on the panel here at the end of the video and you'll see that if you actually put this on there, and I happen to have a panel that looks like these are 19 millimeters apart, uh, you actually have to rotate this connector inside the panel to make sure that the holes line up, which is not what you're gonna want. So one of those numbers that could really bite you is how far apart these mounting holes are. So let's do the same thing. Let's take a look at some Switchcraft. Here's a diagram from Switchcraft. This is from the DS series. Um, lots of illustrations on here. And if we zoom in here to their panel specs, we see here, we see the size of their center hole, 0.953 inches bigger than what Neutrik spec'd out. So if you look at over here how the actual diameter of the outer barrel of their connector, 0.94 inches, what does that tell you? This is gonna be incredibly tight fit. That's only 5,000 difference between the outside dimensions of the backside of this connector and the Neutrik D-hole, which is 0.945. Probably fit, but you're probably gonna get some that are pretty tight too. Just one of those things to watch out for. Uh, another one on this, they're telling for your hardware mounting holes, they're not giving an actual dimension. They're just saying, you know, okay, go for a 540 threaded hole. Probably not actually threaded. You can just drop the bolt right through. You don't actually have, have to have threads in the panel, but they're just basically giving you the screw size specification and they're saying just go from there. Uh, now again, if you had larger, so if you had uh, the 632 or the .138 size holes in your panel, probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. But if they're recommending 540, that's then it's just a matter of, do we find that measurement on the front of their connector? And I'm looking, I'm looking, and right here, mounting holes at .139, which makes sense, .138 goes all the way up to is, uh, the 632. So that should leave us plenty of clearance for our 540 hardware on the front. So again, just a few numbers that you wanna look at on these specifications to make sure that you don't get bit if you order a bunch of connectors and a bunch of panels and things just aren't lining up. Also, all the size for these uh, hardware mounting holes, you wanna make sure that your hardware is gonna fit not only through the hole in the panel, but also through the hole in the connector. Before I get into the standard size bolts, I wanna talk about the Neutrik combo connectors first because these are a little bit unique in their hardware requirements as opposed to a standard panel mount where you just have a, it's, there's a thin amount of material and you just put a bolt right through it. These have these thick pieces of material on the side which are fairly small hole and use a self-tapping screw which actually just cuts its own threads as you put it in. The hardware that you need for those, there's Two official Neutrik variations. This one, the part number being A screw 1.8, and you use this with the A series and the AA series. This is the B screw 1.8, and you use this with the B series. And you can see that this is the self tapping screw that I talked about. This one's a little bit different. This just has standard threads on it because the B series is actually threaded on the on the chassis. So these just go in like a normal bolt. 
Again, this is for the A and the AA series, this is for the B. Now, I don't recommend that you actually buy the Neutra kind because they're really expensive and I've seen them as high as like 28 cents a screw, which is just way too much for these in my opinion. So uh, Redco Audio has a much cheaper alternative, which is about half that price. You can get these in boxes, I think 20 or 25 or 100. And uh, it does the same job as these, no problem. When you start shopping for standard hardware, one of the first choices you're gonna to have to make is the screw finish. If you just go down to the big box like I recommended and get the cheap stuff on the wall, you can see that this is zinc plated, which offers mild corrosion resistance and keeps the steel from rusting out. And again, for most purposes, that's gonna be fine. If you want a slightly better product, I suggest that you move up to a stainless steel screw. This is gonna give a lot better corrosion resistance and it just, I think it actually looks just a little bit better than zinc plated. It has just like a nicer kind of a matte shine to it. It does cost a little bit more, but I think it's one of those things that's going to be worth it, especially on just a small project where you only may need a, a small box of these. Uh, for example, e even the difference between the, the stainless steel ones, if you buy a box of 100 of these, even these big, the bigger screws over here, which are the most expensive, a box of 100 costs about the price of like one of these anyway. So in the grand scheme of things, the hardware is going to be a small factor in your overall budget for your project. So again, I would just recommend step up and get a stainless steel one. You don't have to get into the exotic stainless steel varieties. Like you'll typically see like stainless steel 316 quite a bit, which is actually marine grade. It has a very, very high level of corrosion resistance. Y you just don't need it. And I wouldn't recommend spending uh, money on any of those kind of exotic finishes. Like, or especially you don't want any of those like really harsh chemical treated like exterior kind of screws. You don't want that stuff anywhere near your gear. So I would just recommend st uh, straight stainless steel. And of course, if you want black, just go with black oxide and you'll get the black finish if you have black hardware. Let's talk about screw size. There's four main sizes you'd wanna use. From left to right, on the metric side, we have the M3. Here we have 440, 540, and 632. So the question is, which size do you use? Well, the easiest answer to that is just follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, Neutrik always recommends using M3 on all of their hardware. However, as we saw in the technical diagrams for the Switchcraft parts, they recommended 540 for some of their product lines and 632 for others. Now, this is one of the areas I talked about earlier where you can get into trouble a little bit because if you order this standard panel, uh, there is no way you're gonna fit a 540 or 632 screw into this hole. So the biggest you can fit is the 440. That's just the way it comes. So this is one of the reasons why you have to know what you're buying before you buy it. Now, there's nothing to say that you couldn't um, just get a drill bit and drill those out if you wanted to use the bigger hardware. Uh, that's entirely up to you. If you happen to buy a panel, uh, before you bought your screws and it turns out that the only screw that you can use is 440 or smaller, um, then that's probably gonna be fine. And that's one of the reasons why I said early on, if you just wanna keep this easy and go down to the hardware store and just get your generic bag of 440s, that's because the 440s are almost guaranteed to fit anything you're gonna get. If you move into these larger screw sizes, it just may be a little more difficult. Now it helps to know how big these screws actually are, so you can do a little bit of planning. Uh, these screw sizes, I mean, the dimensions for these things are everywhere out there, it's very easy to find. Um, don't get confused by tap and drill, or tap and die drilling charts that have tons and tons of numbers, like you know major diameters and minor diameters and pitch diameters and all that kind of stuff. Because we're not actually gonna be threading our panels, um, all you wanna know is literally how wide it is, which, from a technical point is called the basic major diameter. And all you're doing is you're literally just taking the actual width of the outside of the threads. So right here on this 632, this is coming out to 17, 128, and let's do millimeters, 0.134, which turns out that one half is just 4,000 short of spec, which should be 0.138. So if you go down the line and you look at what the sizes of all of these are, uh, the M3, of course, is three, three millimeters across. Um, the 440 is 0.112, which is just a little under an eighth of an inch. The 540 is 964, or it's, it's an eighth of an inch exactly. You'll need a 964th hole for that to drop into cleanly. And the 632 is 0.138, uh, which means you'll need a 964th hole for that to drop into cleanly. So where screw size, comes into play in the diameter of the screw. Now let's talk about the length of the screw. For just about every scenario and every part you're gonna have, a 3 8 inch screw is gonna be all you need. If you're on the metric side, go with a 10 millimeter. 
Now, you may need to step up to a half inch if you have a couple conditions. One being if you're using the super thick PowerCon or SpeakCon connectors because that's a lot, just a lot thicker than your average audio connector. And the second reason being most panels, especially if you get steel ones, these are a sixteenth of an inch thick. If you go to aluminum panels, they tend to be an eighth of an inch thick. So if you're combining a one eighth inch thick aluminum panel with the extra thick front of these power cons or speak cons, you're probably going to need to go up to a half an inch just to make sure you have enough threads for the nut to grab onto. And again, if you're on the metric size and need a little bit more length, go to 16 millimeters. We're going to talk about the different head types on screws next, but first you have to make a decision and that is, do you want to front mount or rear mount your jacks? What that means is front mounting, basically just drop it in from the front, whereas rear mounting, you mount it from the rear. Now, not all jacks are designed to be front and or rear mounted. Uh, this one in particular is not. And if you tried to rear mount it after you plugged your XLR cable into there, you wouldn't be able to get it out because there's not enough room to depress the lock tab on that now. This one works well in the front. And you can see it has this raised bit in the center. And it works well from the rear with plenty of room to uh, engage the locking tab. And combo jacks, rear mount only. Now that you know the orientation of your jacks, you can pick out your bolts. Uh, the first one, which is probably also the most common, is flat, where it's just a beveled edge and the top of the screw is completely flat. Uh, one variation on that is the rounded or the oval head, where it still has that bevel on the bottom side going down towards the thread, but the top of it has um, a rounded top to it and or a little mound on the top of the screw head. These are the two you want to use if you front mount because they are designed to go down into the countersink and the jack chassis. If you're going to rear mount, you need another variation which is called a pan head. And you notice um, it doesn't have that bevel anymore. It's completely flat on the bottom. And the reason you need that is so when the jack goes underneath, the bottom of the screw head is now going to rest directly on the panel and it needs to be flat because there's no countersink there. The main difference between these two, it's mainly cosmetic, there's no functional difference. However, I would advise if you start to get into the larger sizes, especially like the 632, and then once again with these oversized connectors like the PowerCon and the SpeakCon, if this sticks out too much, you're not going to have enough clearance for the barrel on the cable end of that connector to come in and do that quarter turn twist and, and made up with the jack. So again, this is just something you just want to make sure you don't have too much material coming up past the front plate on your jack. Last but not least, we have drive type. And drive type, that's your Phillips head, your hex, your Torx, and so on. Uh, for me, I like to keep it simple and just stick with Phillips. Uh, for the amount of force you need to tighten down faster to this size, you don't need to get into like the square heads or, the, or anything like that. Um, this, this is certainly not your woodworking project where you're using like an impact driver to drive this stuff in. Uh, everything's gonna be hand tightened. So again, just for me, I like to keep it simple and just stick with Phillips, but feel free to use whatever you wanna use. Now, after all that screw talk, if your head's just spinning and you don't know what to choose and you just want to make sure these things get stuck in there and never come out, uh, you can always go with rivets. Uh, one eighth inch is the size you need. Uh, again, just make sure that this is actually what you want because if you actually change your mind and want to take any of these checks out of your panel, it's going to be a lot of drilling. You're going to make a mess. But one eighth inch rivets is the size that you want if that's the route that you want to go. Moving on to nuts, this is pretty straightforward, not a whole lot to talk about. Uh, from left to right, we have the 3mm, we have the 440, the 540, and the 632. Now, in the McMaster catalog, and you could probably find these elsewhere, I found a couple interesting variations, which are narrow diameter nuts. So you have a 540, and this is the 540 narrow, which is just a 16th of an inch uh, smaller diameter. Same thing here, a 632, and you have a 16th inch smaller diameter. Now, the reason you want to use these Again, going back to these connectors with the really fat barrels on them, there's only so much clearance room between uh, the edge of your bolt and the edge of the barrel on this connector for your nut to slide into. And if you, again, if you tend to use the, the bigger size hardware, getting a smaller nut may be the difference between getting the nut to fit in there and not getting it to fit in there. So those can be handy on the, the big connectors and the big hardware. 
the nut drivers you need for these. For the three millimeter metric, you need a 5.5 millimeter nut driver. For the 440, the narrow 540 and then narrow 632, you need a one quarter inch. For the standard 540 and the standard 632, you need a 5 16 Now, they also make a narrow version of the 440, and for that you'll need 3 16 I didn't bring it in here because it's just way too small for anything we're going to mount up today. However, if you're getting into like any other kind of mini DIN connector, uh, that could be a useful hardware choice for you. For bolt retention, we have the standard options. We have split washer, we have lock washer, we have a nut with an integrated lock washer, and this just happens to be a red coat part, but you can get these lots of places, and we have thread locker. Now on the thread locker, there's three main variations, at least on the Loctite brand. You have the purple, which is the low strength, which I think is too low strength for connectors of this size. You have the blue medium strength, which is what I recommend. It's medium strength, but you can still disassemble it with just hand tools. Now going on to their high strength, which is their red, you actually need heat to disassemble. And this is where I think you just need to plan ahead a little bit. If you think there's ever a chance that you're going to have to disassemble it, the amount of heat that you have to put into the thread locker to get it to disengage, according to Loctite, is about 550 degrees Fahrenheit or 260 degrees Celsius. Now, you can get those kind of temperatures with a standard handheld heat gun, but that's a lot of heat to be pushing onto a cable for an extended period of time. Uh, assuming that the cable is still connected to the jack while you're disassembling. And I'm thinking in case you actually just wanted to replace a single defective jack or swap out one jack for a different kind and you just wanted to bring that cable back in, you definitely want to desolder that cable, get it well out of the way so you don't just get too much insulation shrink or anything like that while you're trying to get the jack off. So it's one of those things if you do have to uh, take red thread locker off of your panel, make sure to be really protective of any of the other cable that happens to be around that jack. And that's about it for panel mounting. I'm going to leave you with two other topics that I ran into while doing research for this video that I certainly don't have time to go into in depth, but you may want to do a little research on your own. The first one is bolt retention, and that's when we were talking about um, specifically these, your standard split and lock washers. And it turns out that recently some people did some tests and it turns out that a lot of the math that mechanical engineers have used to determine bolt retention methods have not been entirely accurate or at least not entirely complete. And there are some new studies that are basically saying that these kind of bolt retention methods are not nearly as effective as you would have them believe. So uh, that's something we wanna look into. I'll put a couple links in the description. And the second one is galvanic corrosion. And what galvanic corrosion is, basically when you take two different metals, say aluminum and steel, and you put them in contact with one another, and in particular if you add a little bit of electrolyte, like salt air or something like that, that you will get massive corrosion and rust and all this kind of stuff. It's not true rust, but it's a different kind of chemical reaction that happens. Now, I'm bringing this up because you can have mixed metals when you do panel work. For example, steel or aluminum rivets and steel or aluminum panels or stainless steel uh, hardware and aluminum and whatever. And these are nickel coated or who knows what they're coated with, depending on what brand you get. Now, I, I did a lot of research in, into it and I never found a single case that anyone had a problem with it as far as audio work is concerned. And I even talked to one installer and he did a panel for a small PS system that's gonna go on the deck of a cruise ship which is basically a, a perfect scenario for something like that because of all the salt air. And he said he did, it's been out there in service for a couple of years and he's never had any problem. I would be curious if you have ever seen anything like that, do me a favor and uh, leave a comment down below and let me know your experience. Um, the reason it turns out to not be a problem is because the metal never really touches each other because everything has either this powder finish or a paint or it's you know zinc plated or stainless or that kind of thing. So basically the metal just never really comes into contact with one another so the chemical reaction never kicks off. Anyway, I'd be curious to know your experiences. So I hope you learned a lot and make sure to keep in mind when using these large type connectors to check your hardware and don't go too big and make sure to not make obvious mistakes. Uh, like using the wrong jacks on the wrong panel by a large margin, and make sure to read your technical diagrams for something that may look like it's gonna fit, but not. See how offset that is? You have to turn it to get the holes to line up. It's not quite a D-hole. And make sure to choose the right screw types between your front and your rear mounting options. 
And last but not least, in panel mounting and in life, uh, I hope you learn that sometimes things just, uh, sometimes things just don't fit. Okay, see you next time.